Father, may the words of my mouth and meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. If you've read the Bible much, you know that there are a number of stories about people who, in the middle of a deep sleep, have a dream, and God speaks to them through that dream. It's a very common way in which God communicates to people and works with people. It's interesting to me that in the story we read today, we have a case of a person who is unable to sleep, and God works through their insomnia. Now, you know, I've never seen insomnia as a blessing. I don't know about you. But when I'm lying in bed in the middle of the night and I can't get to sleep, I'm not thinking, wow, this is awesome. This is great. I love this. You know, I'm, I'm fidgeting. I'm, I'm getting more and more irritated and upset and frustrated. And, and I'm trying to think of what I can do to try to go to sleep. And, you know, you, we try all these things. You know, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of strategies that I use to try to help me go to sleep when I can't. Sometimes I will, I will play my way through a golf course that I've played and hold a hole, you know. And generally speaking, by the time I get to the 10th, 11th, 12th hole, I've drifted off to sleep. I, I also, you know, I read. Sometimes I have to get up and I read. I, I, I get these emails from people from publishing houses sometimes and one particular public house publishing house seems to always start this email with here are some books for you when you can't sleep and i'm thinking to myself wait so you want you want me to buy books that are so boring that they will put me to sleep that seems counterproductive uh, the other, another thing i love to do is when i was a, when i was young i loved listening to baseball games on the radio of course, we didn't have the internet and things. And uh, I can remember many, many nights listening to Cincinnati Reds games on my little transistor radio, particularly when they were playing on the West Coast. And, you know, you'd hit, listening to these games. And so I've got an MLB app on my phone, and I'll put an earbud in, and I turn on one of those games, and often I drift off to sleep with it. I do wake up sometimes when there's something exciting that happens, and the announcer starts yelling about someone's home run they hit. I also like listening to radio, old radio shows. Shows in the 40s, the 50s, Dragnet, Suspense, Nero Wolf, CBS Radio Mystery Theater. And I, and I have it played for like one episode. And sometimes it takes me five or six nights to get through one episode because I keep falling asleep about five or ten minutes in. I have to keep going back to it again. But, you know, we do these things because we want to go to sleep. We don't want to stay up. What I find fascinating is that it doesn't, in a sense, it doesn't matter whether people are sleeping or can't sleep, God's still at work. We have no idea why the king can't sleep. I've, I've been thinking about that. Maybe it's because he's thinking about the, the luncheon tomorrow and what Esther is going to ask him. I mean, she's so mysterious about it. And you know, in our human nature, we're curious. And I suspect that he's lying, that he may be lying there thinking, what in the world does she want? What, what is so important and so big that she can't tell me the first time we get together and she has to wait till tomorrow? Maybe it's something has happened and there's a, he has this in his mind a fear of some coup that may take place. Maybe he's just had too much caffeine that evening. I don't know why he's unable to sleep, but he isn't. And what I find fascinating about this story and really throughout all of Esther is that God can work overtly and subtly to accomplish his purposes. But the point is, God is always working. I keep going back to John 5, 17, where Jesus says, My Father is always working, and so am I. God is always at work. Revelation 21, 5 says, God says, I'm making everything new. I am always at work. I am always doing something. I am always at, at accomplishing my purposes in the world. And I think that is a significant thing for us to remember because there are times when God can be so subtle about the work he's doing that we are tempted to think God is not working. 
as we've been walking through this pandemic. And now, you know, we're, we've gone backwards some. I suspect the temptation in us is to think, is God working? What's God doing? You have things and moments in your life where you sense that same thing. There's a burden that you're facing. There's a struggle you're facing. It's maybe not your life. Maybe it's people connected to you. Maybe it's just the world in general. And we look at it and we think, God, are are you working? Are you doing anything? Is anything happening? And the confidence that the Scripture gives us, and we see that throughout the whole story of Esther, a story in which God is, is fully working behind the scenes, What the narrator keeps telling us is God is working. Whether we see it or not, God is working. And the question that keeps confronting us is, do we believe that? Do we trust him that he's working? And God works through this tension. There is this tension in the story. There's a tension in in our theological life about God working with us and God working without us. And there are some people who are so, uh, who look at others and see that they are so enamored with the idea that God works without us that they would pro- they proclaim God can only work with us. And there are people who are so enamored with God working through us and with us that they want to say God can never work without us. But the reality is God works. I think plan A in the kingdom of God is that God works with and through his people. You see that in the story. God works through Mordecai. God works through Esther. In the bigger picture, God works through the Jews. Israelites that he calls out and says, you're going to be my people. I want to to partner with you in accomplishing my purposes of redeeming and restoring my creation. And I'm working through you. The church has that calling. Through the centuries, God has called out the church to be his witness, to be his people. Paul writes about this in in, uh, 2 Corinthians 5 and 6 where he talks about how God has given us the gift of reconciliation and that he has called us to be partners with him in accomplishing his grand purposes of redeeming and restoring all of his creation. But there are times that we see in Scripture, and we see this throughout history, in which God works outside of his people. Because God's work is not limited. God will work to accomplish his purposes. And we see that in this story of God doing the work that he needs to do. The the fact that God uses Xerxes and Haman to accomplish his purposes is astounding in some ways. Neither one of them has any interest in Yahweh. Neither one of them has any interest in Yahweh's people. In fact, Xerxes has just signed off on an edict to completely annihilate all of God's people. And Haman is the instigator of that edict. And yet God is working even though they don't even realize it. Now, I don't think, I'm I'm not convinced that God is the kind of God who generally is is maneuvering all the people and the the, pieces of the world in, in like chess pieces on a board to set things up. I don't think, when Haman comes into the palace to ask permission to impale Mordecai, That's certainly not from God. That is not God's will that Mordecai would be impaled. That is not a a part of God's redemptive plan that these kinds of things, the evil would happen. But God uses it. God is able to use the most unlikely things to accomplish his purposes. And And he's continually calling us to believe that that is true. Do we? Do we believe that God can work through circumstances that are, that are not of his doing, but he can work through them anyway? I mean, isn't that what Joseph declares to his brothers 
After they sell him into slavery and through a series of events, he becomes second in the kingdom in, Israel, in Egypt. And they come to him, and when they figure out that he's still alive and he has all this power, and they, you know, they fall down before him begging forgiveness, and he says to them, well, you meant it for evil, but God uses it, used it for good. Do we believe God's working? There's something going on in this story between Xerxes and Haman that God is using. Something about human nature between the two of them. I find it surprising, shocking even, that, that Xerxes would humiliate Haman in this way. I mean, he has, he has raised Haman to second in, in the kingdom. Haman virtually has almost all the power that Xerxes has. Xerxes feels that positively about Haman, that he would give him that kind of power and control and wealth. And it surprises me that he would allow Haman to be humiliated, as he does, to lead Mordecai all around the city in this way. And it makes me wonder if, if there isn't something happening in their relationship that's deteriorating. I think back to Joseph and, and Pharaoh in Egypt. I can't imagine Pharaoh saying, doing that to Joseph. I can't imagine him saying to Joseph, I've raised you to this position. I want everyone to honor you and respect you and listen to you. And now I'm going to humiliate you. I don't see that happening. I think there's something going on here. Maybe it's all of a sudden clicked in Xerxes' mind that this man who, who has put in, he's put in second in position is trying, to, is trying to take the life of the man who saved the king's life. And maybe he, in the back of his mind, questions are starting to form. Haman, why would you do that? Does Mordecai know something about you that you don't want me to know? Is there something going on? You know how human nature works. And somehow I suspect that as that relationship seems, seemingly begins to deteriorate, it is setting up the luncheon that's going to take place a few hours later that day. When Esther reveals Haman's plan. And God uses that. There is, there is such a great arrogance in Haman. But then evil always tends to be arrogant. That's why one of the things the Scripture keeps telling us over and over again, it calls us to humility and to meekness. After this humiliating experience, Haman goes home. And this is one of the most fascinating parts of the story. He goes home and he starts telling his wife and advisors about all the great things that have happened to him. He says, I have all this wealth, a lot of it from the king. I have a great, I've been blessed with a great family. And, and, and I have, I'm second in command to the kingdom. And not only that, I was the only person Queen Esther invited to a banquet along with the king. I have everything. And then he says, but it doesn't mean a thing because Mordecai won't show me the respect that I want. Let's just stop and put that into perspective for a second. He has everything. Everything. And yet one man who doesn't treat him the way he wants to is enough to make him say all of that means nothing. There is something about all the things we grasp for that's, that is never enough. It doesn't matter how much we have. It doesn't matter how much we've accomplished. It doesn't matter how far we have progressed in this world. There is something in us that knows it's not enough. There is something missing. 
And for Haman, it, it, it's really it, it personified in Mordecai and his response to him. For us, it may be something else. But there's something in us that wants to keep thinking that if we just have more, if we just have more, if we just have more, that'll, that will satisfy. When the gospel calls us to give up, to surrender, to let go, and to trust God and find that is where the satisfaction comes. And I am convinced that sometimes, sometimes God allows things in our lives. Sometimes things, things that we wrestle with may be ways in which God can open our eyes to see that our, our focus has gotten off center, that our passions are not any longer for Him like they used to be, that our journey has gotten detoured and, and he's calling us back to that, back to experiencing and living with the one who is continually working for not only good in the world, but good in us. And the issue is, can we see it? We surrender to it. In some sense, it, the, the workings of God and, and surrendering to the workings of God comes back to to a willingness to give up control and power. You know, control and power is one of our big issues. It goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Who's going to have the power? Who's going to have control? And every one of us, in one way or another, wrestles with control. It's, it's at, in some ways, it's at the heart of our, of our sinfulness. And what I find fascinating here is that when Mordecai goes home and, and he tells them about what has happened to him in terms of being humiliated, his wife and the advisors say, well, if you're up against Mordecai, who's a Jew, you don't have a chance. I'm ex I, I sort of expected Haman's next statement to be, what? You couldn't have told me that yesterday uh, before I started all this? Uh, what's the poll for that you told me to put up? You knew who Matt Mordecai was. Why now? I don't know, but something, something has triggered something in them to say, Haman, you're up against something you will never win. Isn't it interesting sometimes that people who, who don't have a relationship with God sometimes are able to see God in ways that we miss? Years ago, I read a story about a, about a, a community a church in a small community that was really concerned about the problem of alcoholism in their, in their little town. And uh, they were so concerned about the damage it was doing to people and families and, and just the community that they decided to have a, a prayer meeting about it. And they got together one night and they prayed and prayed and prayed hour and after hour. They prayed for God to do something about it. And, and that night, a storm came up, and, and lightning hit the, one of the local bars, and no one was injured, but it burned the place to the ground. A couple of days later, the owner of the bar sued the church. <laughs> and, and, they, and, and, they, and when they stood before the judge, you know, they said it was, you know, the church prayed and this happened, and the church said, no, it was just a coincidence. Interesting how real life affects our theology, isn't it? So the judge is listening to this case, and when everybody spoke, he sat there a few seconds, kind of scratched his head, and he said, this is the, this is the strangest case of which I've ever presided. He said, I, ha I, have, I have someone here who, is a, who is, uh, has said they're an atheist proclaiming the power of prayer. And I have a bunch of Christians saying they don't believe in the power of prayer. When I read that story, I thought to myself, hmm, sometimes we miss it. And other people get it. They might not even understand they get it, but sometimes they can see it. 
And we can get so wrapped up in God can only work this way and God can only work this way or God can only work that way that we miss what's right in front of us, that God is at work. Do we believe it? Can we let go of our control about how God works and the, and the, the ways in which God works and the, and, and the people through whom God works, that God can do what he desires to do God has power. Do we trust him? Jesus says to his disciples as as he's preparing to ascend, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. God has all authority. We don't. And one of the differences between God's power having power and us having power is that God's power is always used to accomplish his purposes of redemption and recreation and restoration of his creation. His power is always working for good. And that's why we can trust him. And we can trust him when we see it. We can trust him when we can't. We can trust that God is work, at work when we are confused and, and, and we misunderstand and, and we just don't get it. We can trust him. And we can trust God when it's right in front of us because we know who God is. He's good. And he's merciful. And everything he does is to accomplish his grand purposes redemption and restoration. And the question in front of you and me today, every day, is do we believe that? Do we believe it enough to take our hands off and to follow him and to trust him? I have no idea What may be, what the issue may be that you are holding on to, grasping today. Maybe it's a struggle that you're having. Maybe it's it's people you love, the struggles they're having. Maybe it's the circumstances of our world. I just want to say to you and to me, our God who is love and grace and truth and power is good. And we can trust him. Holy Father, we thank you for who you are. Forgive us. So many things get in our way. Forgive us when we so desperately hold on and grasp. Give us grace to see you, to trust to follow you through the grace of Christ Jesus. Amen.